everybody to our spring event in Federal Society. My name is Adam Hansen, and I'm the president of the William Mitchell Federal Society Student Chapter. Um, we are very excited to have Mr. Clark Neely and Lee McGrath, both of the Institute for Justice. Thank you for everybody who's here today. Um, I know some of you have class at 4.30. Uh, if you need to leave, just pop on out and be respectful to everybody around you. Um, there's also an American Constitution Society happy hour that's going on at 4.30. Um, that's not an excused absence, so we're not going to let you leave for that. So um, you're going you're to like this event better anyways. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Federal Society, um, the FEDSOC is a conservative, libertarian, nonprofit organization that's dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federal Society seeks to educate the legal community through its programs and publications about how, the limited, about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect on the law and public policy. Our national membership is over 40,000 members strong. That includes lawyers, professors, although I don't think any professors here are members of the Federal Society, but we'll work on that. Um, judges, and then state and U.S. Supreme Court justices. So if you're a member of the Federal Society, you're in pretty good company. I'd like to introduce now our uh, distinguished speaker for today's event, Mr. Clark Neely. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Neely is a senior attorney at the Institute for Justice out of the uh, headquarters in, Vir in, in Virginia. He's been there since 2000. The Institute for Justice is the country's first libertarian, civil liberties, public interest law firm. IJ has nation, it's a nationwide firm with offices in Arizona, Florida, Texas, Minnesota, and Virginia. The Minnesota chapter, uh, based in Minneapolis, has represented taxi cab drivers, African hair braiders, homeowners, funeral homeowners, and currently home bakers. Mr. Neely litigates economic liberty, property rights, school choice, First Amendment, and other constitutional cases, both in state and federal court. His recent book, which we have on the table over there, is called Terms of Engagement, and it takes sort of a swing at the conservative uh, call for judicial restraint, um, as opposed to, you know, to the judicial activism that conservatives often um, kind of harp on. And he takes kind of a different approach to that, and it's worth reading in the book. It's a, it's a good read. And many of you have read in your constitutional law liberties course, the Heller decision from 2008 about the Second Amendment. Mr. Neely was co-counsel in that case with Alan Gura, who we had last winter, to talk about the Second Amendment. So uh, he's got a wide breadth of, of constitutional law underneath his belt that he litigates. Uh, and full disclosure, I am a, currently a law clerk at the Institute for Justice in the, Minnesota, in the Minneapolis, Minnesota chapter. Um, if this topic today or any other constitutional law topics interest you, I'd be happy to talk to you about my work there, what I do as a law clerk, or either of these two would be um, happy to, to talk about that what we do, and then they have clerkships every fall, spring, and winter, and summer rather, and if you're interested, check out ij.org or send an email to uh, kmcbride at ij.org if you're at all interested. Uh, but with that, I think I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Neely. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me down, and uh, it's nice to be here. I'll start off by adding a little plug for um, everybody thinks that they're interested in public interest law. Uh, Lee and I would be happy to uh, visit with you afterwards. It's, uh, it's great. It's such a fun way to, um, to practice law. I was in a big firm in Dallas for four years after I got out of law school. And, um, I think I had one of the better big firm experiences of anybody that I know, but it was still a big firm experience. So it was pretty clear to me that it wasn't ultimately for me. Uh, I, just, I wanted to do something I could really put my heart into, and public interest law is, is that. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be in a sort of a bleeding heart way. I'm a libertarian, so of course mine doesn't bleed. Um, but um, really, whatever you're interested in, uh, whatever your thing is, uh, there's, there's probably either, well, hopefully there's somebody out there doing that, and if not, then that's a niche that needs to be filled, and um, it's, incredibly, uh, it's incredibly rewarding. So if anybody's interested um, in working for us or um, just interested in how do you get your foot in the door, we'd be happy to, to visit with you about that. So I'm here to talk to you today about um, civil forfeiture, or civil asset forfeiture, however you want to say it. I have to say, um, I just recently got into this in the last year or two. Um, so I've been for 14 years at IJ, you know, litigating mostly economic liberty property rights cases. Um, did a lot of school choice a while back. And um, I have to say, uh, for a libertarian constitutional litigator to be able to say on a particular issue, this has got to be the worst, uh, sleaziest thing I've ever seen the government doing, is really saying something. And when it comes to civil forfeiture, it's the worst, sleaziest thing um, I think I've ever seen the government doing. And I use the word sleazy advisedly. It might sound pejorative, but in this case, it's just accurate. Um, civil forfeiture is an absolute disgrace to our system. Um, it's unconstitutional, in my opinion, from start to finish. Uh, and I can't think really, it would be almost difficult to design a worse public policy 
Um, if you just want to sit down and think, well, what's the worst mix of factors I could put together to come up with a thing that is most opposite of just government? Um, whether, you know, sort of the framers definition or enlightenment theory or whatever you're into. Hopefully everybody has at least some concept of just government. If you wanted to come up with a policy that was the most antithetical to any conception of just government, civil forfeiture would be right in that ballpark. Because it's, uh, and I'm going to, you know, besides trashing it at the beginning, I'm actually going to explain to you what I think is so wrong about it. But it's just absolutely one of the worst things that I've ever seen. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the concept of civil forfeiture, so let me walk you through it real quickly. Um, are people familiar with whether you'll sometimes see these cases in the news or, or even you know reported cases where it's uh, United States versus one briefcase with one hundred and ten thousand dollars and fourteen cents in it or something like that or you know um, oftentimes you see the it'll be either the state of Minnesota or the United States against one GMC Tahoe which just I mean we actually have an amicus brief that's that's not even made up one Chevy Tahoe I think it is um, I don't know why they're always seizing those but anyway you might know why these cases have these names why is it the government versus a piece of properties, you know? Well, um, forfeiture has its origins um, in the uh, 17th century, I believe, when uh, basically the British passed these things called the Navigation Act. It's the acts that said that uh, all imports and exports to Britain had to be on British flag ships. And so uh, what they did was essentially they needed a way to um, uh, be able to seize cargo from ships that were not British flag. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, if you catch a ship on the high seas or you know wherever they would catch it, uh, the owner of the ship is nowhere to be seen. So you're not going to acquire jurisdiction over the owner of the ship, the owner of the cargo. You're not going to acquire jurisdiction over the recipient of the, of the uh, contraband. And so they had to come up with some way that they could nevertheless still take the ship and or the cargo on board. And that's uh, what they came up with um, was was essentially this procedure where you proceed against the property itself. For those of you who are civil procedure ma mavens, you may remember this is called in rem jurisdiction, you're essentially proceeding against the thing. And um, that process or that procedure continues today. And so when the government uh, takes somebody's property through civil forfeiture, they don't accuse the person uh, of wrongdoing. They literally accuse the, pro the property. So you can literally have the United States government versus one 16.9 ounce bottle of purified drinking water if the government wanted to. Well, you know, they probably wouldn't, but the federal government, who knows, they might. Um, and, um, and this should sort of suggest that there's something perhaps a little odd about this uh, procedure. In fact, there's a lot that's odd about this procedure. But it starts with this uh, legal fiction that is hundreds of years old, has no application in the modern setting. Um, the, the police and the federal government are not seizing cargoes on the high seas. They are not in a position where they have some difficulty acquiring personal jurisdiction over the owner of the property. They know perfectly well who the owner of the property is. So why are they still using this procedure where they proceed against the property? Well, because it enables the government to completely stack the deck in the government's favor. Uh, and that's what I'm going to spend some time describing to you. So, um, and you guys hopefully have read stories about this or heard about this. Um, but essentially the way it works in real life is somebody's driving down the highway uh, with, let's say, five or ten thousand dollars in cash on them. They get pulled over, perhaps legitimately, perhaps not. Perhaps it's just one of these sort of stop and, and have a look type of traffic stops. And um, many departments, many police officers, simply have this basically a conviction uh, that there is a certain amount of money beyond which it is not reasonable or plausible to believe uh, that, that somebody's carrying that amount of money who's not involved in crime in some way. And so what they'll do is if you have more than that amount of money, and it's not written down in any policy manual, it's not reduced to some objective figure, it's really just the discretion uh, of the individual officer in the field, but if you have more than that amount of money on you, they'll just say, well, I don't believe that that money came from a, a legal source, so I'm going to assume that it came from drug dealing, money laundering, any list, but the list will always be, of course, uh, uh, forfeitable activity, and they take, they take the money on the spot. Uh, and in many states, and I can believe in Minnesota, yeah, in Minnesota, um, among others, uh, when they take that money, actually title, believe it or not, now vests in the government. So the property at that point actually belongs to the government, and that's when everything gets flipped around, or at least everything that you guys are used to thinking of as the features of due process, the features of a just legal system, they get completely switched around, where now is incumbent on the property owner, actually, to make the case that that property that belonged to them up until the moment when it was seized by a law enforcement officer um, is in fact 
uh, the proceeds of legitimate activity. In other words, you've got, uh, you, you know, you, you, you had a big day in Vegas, you won the lottery, you earned it perhaps, uh, and you actually have to prove that in court. And along the way, uh, the government will stack the deck against you in as many different ways as you can think of. So just for example, um, generally speaking, the presumption will be in favor of the government. In other words, there'll be a legal presumption that the property is illegally, uh, was illegally derived by you. So you have to go back and literally dig through your bones. You have to find some way to prove uh, that, that you either won or earned or whatever that money. Um, and at every step along the way, the procedure favors the government. So let me actually illustrate this. I'm working on a, uh, a civil forfeiture case right now in Michigan, um, in federal court in Michigan. And the number of, uh, of uh, federal laws that um, basically provide for civil forfeiture um, are mind-boggling, but the law at issue in this particular case uh, is a, it's called structuring. Has everybody ever heard of structuring? It's a money, it's kind of money laundering law. Okay, I'll describe it to you. So, um, oh, let me say first, the reason I'm emphasizing civil forfeiture here is what's, what's very unique about civil forfeiture uh, is that they don't actually have to charge you with a crime. So the conduct, they, they, they will allege that you've engaged in some criminal conduct, but they don't have to charge you, and they don't have to get a conviction in order to keep the property. That's why it's called civil forfeiture. There is also criminal forfeiture. So if you were, for example, charged with uh, uh, running a drug operation, and they go through a whole criminal trial, you get convicted at the end of that, then the government can also take, for example, the cars that you're using to drive the drugs around, the house that you use to manufacture and sell the drugs. Um, those properties would be forfeitable, but that would be criminal forfeiture because you've been convicted of a crime, and then they tie those properties to the, the criminal activity. That's criminal forfeiture. Civil forfeiture is much more insidious because they allege that you've engaged in some kind of criminal behavior, but they don't have to prove it, or at least they don't have to prove it in anything like the criminal system with all of its attendant procedural protections uh, for potentially innocent people. Um, so that leads me back to Michigan, where the clients that we represent are not potentially innocent, they are demonstrably innocent. In fact, they're very nice people. Uh, father and daughter who run a grocery store together in Fraser, Michigan, which is about 20 miles north of Detroit. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful little grocery store. It's uh, kind of a, um, sort of in between a convenience store and a regular size grocery store. Um, they've got the best meat counter in the whole metropolitan area. Uh, they have really nice baked goods that have been in there. It smells wonderful. Um, and they run it together. So they do about a third of their business in cash, and um, as that cash comes in, at a certain point, obviously, you want to move it out of the store. Um, I emphasize again, they're here in Detroit, so we'll probably do the, <laughs> the numbers. You want to have that. You don't want a reputation as a store that keeps a lot of cash around. Probably anywhere, but certainly not here. And um, this presents a problem, it turns out, because under federal law, um, banks have to report cash transactions above $10,000. So if you go into a bank with $12,000, $11,000, and you try to deposit it, um, they actually have to fill out a form. And we'll send that form to the Treasury. The Treasury knows that there's this cash transaction that's going on. Uh, some people really are uh, criminals. Some people really are trying to stay off the radar screen for criminal purposes. Uh, and so what would happen is that people would go into a bank if they wanted to stay off the radar screen. Um, and I fully, fully admit that there are some people who are doing this for criminal reasons. They would go into a bank, for example, with $15,000, and they go up to one teller and deposit nine, and the next teller and deposit six, in the hopes that that would not result in a form being filled out. Uh, only knows that it actually does, because the bank keeps track of how much you deposit in any one day. But let's say you broke it up into two different days. You were smart. Um, the, uh, at a certain point, uh, the bank would, um, even though you're keeping your deposits under $10,000, the bank's going to report that to the government as a suspicious activity. There's enough of a pattern of sub-$10,000 transactions. And that's what got uh, my client, Sandy Thomas, and uh, her father, Terry Deco, into trouble in Michigan. What happened, and we're not sure yet, we haven't done discovery, but what I think happened, what I'm pretty sure happened, is that the bank reported them to the federal government because it saw the following pattern. Um, they were coming in there about every week with anywhere between six and $9,000, over and over and over again. We don't dispute that, that definitely happened. Now, without doing any significant investigation, literally just on the basis of this report, the government goes into court um, and um, gets a secret warrant, an ex parte warrant. Uh, they present to the court evidence that there's been all these deposits of less than ten thousand dollars. They get an ex parte warrant, and they go to the store's bank account, bank account belonging to Sandy and Terry, and they take everything that's in it, everything, it's thirty-five thousand six hundred and eleven dollars, just like that. And then they, and this is an IRS criminal task force that did this. Then they go over to the store later that day to do a little victory lap to tell them, oh yeah, we took your cash. Um, and believe it or not, the first that so my um, client uh, Terry Decker has got all of the bills that are due to his vendors lined up on his desk. He's getting ready to pay the meat guy and the milk people and the 
bakery. So all these checks that he's got to mail out that day to pay the people who've been supplying his store. And the first thing he thinks, he just looks up at these two IRS agents and he says, how am I going to pay my vendors? And they were incredibly disrespectful. He just looked down and said, I don't care. Go home and get some more money. You know you've got an ATM there. You know, basically being very derisive towards him, um, just assuming that he was a criminal. So, there's an interesting aspect of this structure of the statute. So the statute makes it a crime to um, engage in cash transactions for the purpose of evading the $10,000 reporting requirement. So that's why they call it structure. You are structuring your transactions. You're putting $6,000 in one day, $9,000 another, $8,000 another, so it's always less than $10,000. Here's the problem. So for those of you who are interested in criminal law, you probably already picked up on this. There is a mens rea requirement. It is only illegal to do this if you do it for the purpose of evading the bank reporting requirements, the $10,000, the above $10,000 reporting requirement. Well, guess what? There can be legitimate business reasons for having that kind of pattern of cash transactions. Can anybody think of one? Most small businesses have insurance policies. Does anybody want to guess what the cash cutoff is for the average small business policy? It's $10,000. We actually checked with the insurance agent. For 25 years, they've had a small business insurance policy, and for 25 years, their insurance broker has told them, get the cash out of the store before it gets to $10,000, because if it goes over that, it won't be covered. And their accountant told them the same thing. Don't let it go over $10,000, it won't be covered. That's the explanation for the pattern. No one ever asked them from the IRS. No one ever paid them the courtesy. Well, not before they took the money. No one ever came by the store and said, you know, there's this pattern, what's up? They literally went to court, got this secret ex parte warrant, cleaned out the bank account, and you know what happens then? Because we did a lot of investigation, and we talked to a bunch of other individuals and businesses in the same area that were victimized. I used that word advisedly. I used it in the brief. That were victimized by the same IRS criminal task force. Uh, <clears throat> and the, um, the thing that they all have in common is, these guys never show up and ask you in advance what accounts you have. They don't care. They just want the money. Because guess what happens next? I mean, I've never been shaken down by the mafia, but this, my impression is that it would go something like this. The next call you get is from the U.S. attorney working on the AUSA working on the case. And what has been related to me consistently by these people is that the conversation proceeds like this. Yeah, so you've committed this very serious felony. It's called structuring. And um, if you just go ahead and agree to let us keep 80% of what we took, we'll go ahead and forget that you committed that felony. That's how it works. So there's the serious felony you've engaged in this very serious criminal conduct, serious enough that they can come in and take your entire bank account, but all is forgiven if you will just agree to let them keep 80% of the money. Does anybody want to guess where that money goes? Right into the bank account of the seizing agency. Right into the bank account of the IRS. They actually split it up with DOJ. DOJ gets to uh, take out the litigation costs. So DOJ gets a piece, IRS keeps the rest. That is the crux of one of the biggest problems with civil forfeiture, is the profit incentive. You don't think that these people's, these people's behavior um, is influenced by that profit motive. Um, I'm not saying that the individual agents get to keep that money, but for any of you who know people who are prosecutors, know people who work in law enforcement, know people, you know, these are type A by and large people, they're competitive, this is all about putting scalps up. We seized $100,000 last week. Oh yeah, well I got 120. Believe me, that's how it works. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll share with you a little anecdote. Um, we're looking at a case in Tennessee that was called to our attention when this wonderful local uh, news uh, um, station did this great investigation where they started looking at this um, practice that they have in Tennessee, where they have these, these kind of, um, I forget what they call them, their um, <clears throat> task forces, jurisdictional task forces. And uh, basically what it is is these um, police, they'll be like a mix of state, county, and local police, they'll get together, form a task force, and they set up shop on the interstate. Um, to, do, to do drug seizures, what they call drug seizures. And the idea is that they'll pull over cars, they have who knows what um, you know, sort of matrix they use for deciding whether to pull over the car. But they pull over the car on the you know, suspicion of, of potentially running drugs uh, or engaging in drug-related activity and try to initiate a forfeiture. And they're pulling in a lot of money. Um, here, and so the, the TV camera went undercover, they got some interesting, or the crew got, it, got some interesting shots and so forth. But here's one of the, here's the most interesting fact that came out of it. Um, <clears throat> in a number of states, including Tennessee, what you will find is that um, if you've got interstates that run east-west, the drugs basically go from west to east. They're basically moving from Mexico to our east coast. That's where the drugs go. What's going back west? The car's still cash. So you've got drugs coming east, cash-filled cars going west. The TV station found out that 90% of the time this task, these task forces set up 
on the north side of the highway. Which direction are those cars going? West, with cash in them. So there's this terrible poison that's being unleashed on our people on the east coast. There's these, all these drugs are headed out east, and the cops are letting them all go by because they're all set up on the other side of the highway, stopping cars headed the other direction to get the cash. They really don't care that much about the drugs. And this is another really important point, and that is the distortion of law enforcement priorities. If you're a cop working in Tennessee, are you going to go out and investigate that difficult to prove rape case or assault case or murder, God forbid? Or are you going to do better setting up on the north side of I-40, pulling in cash filled cars? Which is going to get you a promotion factor? Which is your boss going to appreciate more? And believe me, that's the way it works. And when I said earlier that it is a sleazy, sleazy business, that's part of what I was referring to. You have sworn law enforcement officers who are spending time not investigating the kinds of serious crimes that I just mentioned, and they're just pulling people over. Now, I'm not going to dispute that some number of those cars probably did, uh, or probably were, running drug money back to wherever it came from. And my position would be, OK, if you can prove that, fine. Bring a criminal case, prove it. And if you get the criminal conviction, take the money. Absolutely. Take the car. Take everything you can find. But that's not how it works. In Tennessee, as in most jurisdictions, they don't bring a criminal case. So once again, oh, you committed this very serious felony of drug conspiracy. But we'll just take the cash. And that is the way it works. Um, a statistic that I read recently, um, it might even be our amicus brief that we did here in the Minnesota Supreme Court, I believe 80% um, of, um, of these forfeitures are unconnected. There's, no, there's never any criminal prosecution. So 80% of the time, they just take the money or the, or the car or the house and no, no criminal follow. So ask yourself, I mean, is this, is this, does this suggest something about how serious the police really feel about the conduct at issue? Or is this really just policing for profit? That's what we call it. We call it just unabashedly uh, policing for profit. Uh, another thing that we discovered, and you can read this, we have a, a report that we've done online called Policing for Profit. Got a catchy title, easy to remember. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at it. It's online. Um, <clears throat> would anybody be surprised to hear that the police sometimes, and the prosecutors sometimes, use these proceeds for, let's say, questionable activities? They do. Sometimes it's blatantly illegal activities. We found a prosecutor in Texas who actually used uh, civil forfeiture proceeds to finance his run for re-election. One would think that even in Texas, I'm from Texas, <laughs> they have a fairly aggressive mentality towards crime and criminals that goes back some, you know, some uh, ways in history. But even there, you would think that he would get, he can't do that. Uh, another one was a little more modest in his uh, expenditure. He bought a margarita machine for the office. Uh, Georgia had the sheriff's department that bought football tickets. Um, and then you've got this kind of uh, sort of gray area stuff. I mean, I don't think he's that gray, but I guess, I guess some people are inclined to be favorable to law enforcement's gray. Turns out there's a lot of law enforcement agencies that are flying their people first class out to California where they just happen to have a continuing education for police in places like Napa Valley. Don't ask me why. Um, I've been there. I can sort of surmise. Uh, but this is oftentimes the way this money is used. So it, there's abuse in the front end how they take it, the circumstances under which they take it, the incentives, um, and how those affect law enforcement. And there's abuse on the back end, how the money is used by these departments. Um, and I know these are anecdotal, but if you actually read the report, um, we, we, it's more systematic. You can see, I, I, you know, I could literally sit here and just give you example after example for hours uh, of the way that this um, uh, civil forfeiture distorts um, the behavior of law enforcement agencies. I'll tell you a few more stories. Um, <clears throat> we had our first civil forfeiture case um, was in Massachusetts. I lived there for a while when I was a kid. And um, it was a suburb of Boston called Tewksbury. Um, it's the kind of place you would probably, you would, like Mark Wahlberg could have grown up there. It's sort of rough around the edges. It used to be a factory town. Um, it's not a terrible place, but it's a little down at the heels. And our client, uh, Russ Caswell, and his family own a motel called the Motel Caswell, just off of the interstate in Tewksbury. Motel Caswell is the kind of place that you would go to stay if you didn't want to pony up the full amount for the Motel 6 and you didn't need a clean towel. Um, but it's nice. It's not an awful place. It's just a place you know, you know, thrown out of your house by your spouse. Maybe you had to go um, be by yourself a while. You might stay at the Motel Caswell. Anyway, um, over a course of about 25 years, Motel Caswell rented over 100,000 rooms, you know, nights. And of that 100,000 rentals over like a, a 25 year period, the police uh, uh, basically identified about a dozen drug arrests. Um, I would suspect you could identify a dozen drug arrests at, let's say, the dorms at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't need to go back 25 years, but fair. 
Uh, anyway, so over a period of 25 years, about 100,000 room rentals, 12 grand arrests. They seized the motel on that basis. Working together with the federal government, one thing we discovered in the course of investigating the case, there is a DEA agent whose entire job, he's, he works, he's, he's assigned to Massachusetts, his entire job is to surf the internet looking for forfeitable properties. What is a forfeitable property? Any property where there's been some drug arrests. But there's a further factor, which I'm sure is not listed in the DEA manual, that makes the property particularly attractive uh, for forfeiture. And uh, let's see if you can figure it out. There was an enterprising reporter in Tewksbury who looked into this because you know, it made a splash, made a bigger splash when we got involved. One of the things this reporter found out was that <clears throat> if you would go out and actually go look at the uh, crime reports for the area, the Dunkin' Donuts right across the street had the same number of drug crimes, as did the Walmart, as did the Motel 6 that I just mentioned. None of them were forfeited. Why? Why? What's different between the family-owned Tewksbury Motel and Dunkin' Donuts, Walmart, and Motel 6? Yes, right. Who can, who, can, who can afford lawyers? Who is more likely to put up a fight? Oh, and by the way, the mortgage on the motel, uh, the motel capital paid in full. So it was the family's retirement and that's it. No mortgage, no corporate lawyers to mess with, just a family to exploit. And that's exactly what they did. They went in, guns blazing, both the U.S. The US Attorney's Office essentially joint ventured it with the Tewksbury Police Department because there's this thing called equitable sharing. <laughs> Talk about a misnomer, <laughs> not equitable in the least. But what happens essentially is the federal government teams up with a local law enforcement agency and they, they whack up the proceeds. They work together to do the forfeiture and they whack up the proceeds. The local guys get up to 80% um, of the proceeds and that's what they did to the Motel Caswell. Um, we got involved after I think two years of litigation when they were basically just about to run out of money and spent something like $200,000 of their own money trying to save their property which was worth about $1.5 million. Uh, we were able to get involved, take over the case pro bono, and um, um, basically, you know, as the old saying, um, we brought a gun to a knife fight. And we uh, basically we put them on trial in the court of public opinion. We took the case to a bench trial before a federal magistrate uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and a government case completely fell apart. And that's an interesting thing, because that happens a lot. If you can find a lawyer who will take your case the distance, the government's case often does fall apart because it's going to be built on sand. So the Michigan case I just described to you, where the conduct was perfectly innocent, if the government had just asked, the Motel Caswell, where the conduct at issue was no different from any other business on their, on their street, that's what you will often find out. But the trick, the key, the challenge, is to get these cases to that point that the average property owner just can't do it. Because the average seizure is not $1.5 million. It's not even the $35,000 that was taken from Sandy and Terry. It's under $1,000. Cops will literally take $500 or $1,000 for something. How much is it worth to get that money back? Who in their right mind is going to go hire a lawyer to represent you in court to get your $1,000 back? So in a perverse way, the, the, the law enforcement actually probably makes more money the lower the seizure is because it, like, nobody's going to take an entire day off of work. And that's best case scenario. We're looking at a case in uh, Philadelphia right now. It's been the subject of a number of news articles um, where they will take as little as $200 off of people in certain parts of town. I'll let you, see if you can guess which parts of town. Um, uh, where they consider $200 to be a suspicious amount of cash for somebody to be carrying. And what we've discovered, it was, it was actually written about um, in this uh, article, we, we've actually got a document of this. You have to show up at the courthouse five times before you even get in the presence of a judge. So the prosecutors who've taken the money from, well, the police take it, but the prosecutors to whom the money has been uh, tendered and who are going to run the show from now on, they set five different hearings. And not one of those hearings will there be a judge present. It's all meetings with them. But guess what? The way their process works, if you miss even one of those, it's over. Your property is forfeited. So every single one of those um, is a kind of a do or die for you. So you have to take off how many days from one? I mean, imagine if you're an innocent property owner, they take $500 from you. You have to show up five times before you even get in front of the judge. And if you think that's an accident, if you think that that's just sort of a, um, an unintentional feature of, a, you know, sort of a, I don't know, a legislative uh, oversight or something like that, I'm sorry, you're not living in the real world. That is a design feature, not a bug. It's a feature. And the feature is to discourage people, even innocent people, from getting their property back. Um, I'll tell you uh, <clears throat> one more. Oh, by the way, so the way things stand in Michigan, uh, I should go back to that case because it has kind of a, doesn't have an ending yet. We're still litigating it. Our clients got their property back. Um, and I'll describe how because it's both kind of outrageous, but 
in, in this particular case, it worked out well. Uh, does anybody remember a case called Fuentes v. Shevin from Civil Procedure of Common Law? So this is a, a, a procedural due process case from the 1970s where the question was, um, if the government comes to take your stuff, whatever it might be, do you get a hearing before they can take it? And in that case, it actually happened to be, I believe it was two cases that were combined together. Uh, one involved a Florida law, the other involved a Pennsylvania law, but they were very similar. And the laws essentially allowed somebody who had sold an item on credit, so a, a appliance, refrigerator, something like that, to sell it to somebody on credit, and if they stop making their payments, or you allege that they stop making their payments, you can actually go down to the courthouse, just fill out a piece of paper saying, you know, uh, uh, Joe Bob bought a dishwasher from me, uninstalled him, hasn't been making his payments, and um, a constable, like you know, a law enforcement officer, would actually take that and just go and grab that dishwasher. And um, that was challenged, got all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court said, no, an absolute bedrock requirement of procedural due process is notice and an opportunity to be heard. You may have actually heard this term before. Notice and an opportunity to be heard. I'm told it goes back sometime in common law. Uh, and that was a bedrock feature of our system of justice. And what the Supreme Court held was, you have an absolute right to a pre-seizure hearing. In other words, before they can take that dishwasher from you, you get to go in front of a neutral adjudicator, a judge, and have that person determine whether or not, for example, the company's got to pay for it in order. Maybe they've got the numbers reversed. Maybe you've got some handsome checks that you can show to make it clear that they made a mistake. But one way or the other, you get in front of a judge before they can take that property. Um, because it really is true, by the way, that possession is not intense in the law. I mean, that's a saying, but it's also kind of true. So once they get that property, man, things change. It gets very much a lot harder to get it back. So, Supreme Court held that it went under truly extenuating circumstances. I mean truly extenuating. Then the government can sometimes take the property, but as long as they provide a prompt post-seizure hearing. So like within days, you have to be able to get in front of a judge and say, hey, there's been a mistake. And um, that's a bedrock requirement of procedural due process. But guess what? When the federal government created, when Congress created federal civil forfeiture laws, they didn't provide for that. They deliberately omitted that procedure. So there's this law called CAFA, which believe it or not is actually the um, reform law. It's the one that's supposed to be better than the one that was uh, basically enacted uh, in the middle of the early part of the drug war in the 1980s. They, they enacted this really uh, draconian uh, forfeiture law. CAFA uh, was, um, I forget, it was uh, somebody in the 1990s. You remember what year was that? Uh, Henry Hyde was the uh, right. you know, author, so it was the early 2000s, 1998, 2002, and yeah. So capital was an attempt to reform you know, the, 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 the bad forfeiture law, but they still omitted this, this provision for a pre-seizure or prompt post-seizure hearing, at least when the government seizes cash belonging to a business. If they don't take the whole business, just the cash, you don't get any hearing. And I didn't know that. I mean, I just knew this was the first forfeiture case I really litigated as a lead lawyer. And so I had to get up to speak on this. I'm sitting here shaking my head saying, so let me get this straight. So if some rinky-dink sheriff's deputy, I mean, no offense, but you know, non-federal agent, had showed up at my client's grocery store to repossess a refrigerator, the Supreme Court has made abundantly clear that they would absolutely have a right to be in front of a judge before the government could take that refrigerator. But when it's a criminal task force in the IRS, they want to take the entire operating account belonging to the store, there's not only no provision for a pre-seizure hearing, there's no provision for a hearing at all. The government's position, which it actually took in briefing and in an oral argument for our federal district judge when we challenged this, their position was, your hearing is the jury trial that you get in a year or two. Oh my God. And that just, I mean, that tells the whole story as far as I'm concerned right there. Again, if it were a refrigerator and some sheriff's deputy, the Supreme Court would be all over it. Oh, oh no, no, you can't take the refrigerator without a pre-seizure hearing. Oh, is it just the whole entire bank account of that, of that business? Oh no, no, no. That's fine. And so we actually had to make up a procedure. We literally just made up a procedure. I filed a brief. The brief was, was, was titled, we actually scratched our heads for a while to even know what to call it. We finally decided to call it our motion for prompt post-seizure hearing. Because we couldn't get a pre-seizure hearing. That, that, that ship had sailed. Uh, to use a historical reference that I referred to earlier. But, so that ship had sailed. And we said, okay, well, how about a prompt post-seizure hearing? So we actually went to have, we had a hearing where we were going to have a fight about whether my clients get a hearing. It's really surreal. Uh, so in the middle of all this, um, the U.S. Attorney, the AUSA, who we're up against, um, who I privately refer to as the whippersnapper because he's a lot younger than me, he's like six years out of Georgetown, doesn't really know what he's doing. Um, <coughs> he had filed a bunch of these cases, and some of them were in front of different judges in, in the Eastern District of Michigan, which is where Detroit is. And um, he, uh, he's not really into deadlines, it turns out. Um, he's a bit of a procrastinator. 
And there are some really important and, and sort of set in stone deadlines uh, that, that are involved in the federal forfeiture statute. And he had, um, basically the way he had interpreted it was that when you take somebody's property, you have to, the government lets them know you've got your property. If you claim to own it and you want it back, you have to send us a claim. And a claim is nothing more than just a letter saying, yes, that's my property and I want it back. Under federal law, the federal government has 90 days from the day they receive your claim um, to file a forfeiture action in federal court to keep your property. So our client sent in the claim, certified mail, whatever. So our the whippersnapper, my opposing counsel, he took the position that that letter was not received the day the post office dropped it off and filled out the certified mail return, but it was received after three days it took to work its way up from the mail room to the forfeiture unit. And his position was, no, that's when we received the letter. And he filed his action, his uh, forfeiture case, 90 days from that day. So we got in a big fight about basically whether he had um, uh, met his deadline. And, and keep in mind, by the way, that we're only having this fight because we're very aggressive. We managed to get in there and sort of you know, jam our foot in the door and say, hey, I know federal law doesn't provide for us to even be talking to you right now, Judge, but we're going to talk to you right now. <laughs> so anyway, in a parallel case, in a different, uh, I guess, a different small business in front of a different judge, that judge reached a decision that that interpretation of statute was wrong, and this AUSA had missed his 90-day deadline. And instead of fighting it in all of the other cases he had going, he just basically hoisted the white flag and said, okay, fine, everybody gets their property back. I think in large measure, because we were already representing two of the other property owners um, and doing press releases about every other day. Um, I don't think he cared for that. But anyway, so um, the point I'm making is uh, there could be a lot of reasons why somebody should get their property back. It happens that my clients were innocent and this guy blew the deadline, but really either of those should have been legitimate, independent reasons. But the whole point again is to make sure that no one ever gets to go in front of the judge and have this conversation. That's why federal law doesn't provide for a pre-seizure or a post-seizure hearing. And the thing I found the most surreal was arguing in front of a federal district judge, and I made the whole point about one case v. Shevin and the refrigerator and the ranking and shirt and everything like that, and this guy's looking at me like I'd grown another head out of my shoulders, like, eh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I get that the Supreme Court says that they would have gotten a hearing had been a refrigerator, but this is different, you know, this is their bank account. I'm kind of like, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, okay, wait, no, you meant that differently than I meant. <laughs> so the whole thing is a bit Alice in Wonderland, um, and, um, we, uh, so we got, their, we got their money back. We filed a countersuit. We're, we're, we're basically, we are now seeking both a declaratory judgment and an injunction. The injunction we want is that the, the judge in this case forbid this IRS criminal task force from doing these structuring related forfeitures without committing himself to a prompt post-seizure hearing. We're not even going to fight the pre-seizure. I think it should be pre-seizure, but we know we're not going to do that. So at least a prompt post-seizure hearing so people can go in and make the same points I've just been describing to you. Um, <clears throat> I want to wrap up the Caswell case. That was the one with the motel in Massachusetts. We won that, um, it, it, as I said, a bench trial in front of a federal magistrate judge. Um, the government got so much bad press and their case fell apart so spectacularly and the ruling from the magistrate judge was so sternly worded they actually decided not to appeal and then we got to have a, a fight with them over our attorney's fees. Because one, one of the very few good things about federal forfeiture law is that um, if you prevail, if you get your client's property back, then the government actually does have to pay your attorney's fees even if you're pro bono. Um, and so we got a, a good chunk of change from the government. Which, by the way, if you ever go into this line of work, um, make sure you make a copy of every check that you get from the government um, when they have to pay you for the privilege of having them kick their ass. Um, I've gotten a few of those, and I really treasure them. I mean, you know, for different reasons. But anyway, um, so that's kind of civil forfeiture in a nutshell. I guess if I had to sum it up, what I would say is this. Um, <clears throat> civil forfeiture is based on a procedural fiction that was invented to enable the British government to seize um, the contraband cargo of ships in the 17th century when you couldn't acquire jurisdiction over the owners of those ships because they lived in France, which by the way, England was at war with for most of this time period. Um, and yet they continue to do it. They continue during a period of time when there's no question about personal jurisdiction, where you know exactly who the owner is and can bring them into court. Um, civil forfeiture, unlike criminal forfeiture, is shorn of almost every procedural due process protection um, that, that, that basically are formed the bedrock core of, of the American system of law. It is completely, the deck is completely stacked in favor of the government to ensure that they get to keep the property. Um, more often than not, the owner actually, the owner of the property has to prove that the property is innocent. I mean, that's a weird way to put it, but you actually have to prove that your money was not derived from some criminal activity. Completely reverses the presumption, um, whereas normally the government would have to prove that you or your property engaged in criminal act. In this case, the burden of proof is on you. And then, of course, there's the profit incentive. 
there is the incredibly perverse incentive of essentially enabling uh, police officers and prosecutors to basically decide, when you get up and go to work this morning, what do you want to do? Do you want to go after those people who, if you get the money from them, you, know, you get to buy a new Tahoe, um, or there's that word again, get to buy a new Explorer or whatever, maybe a new battle tank, I guess that's what they're into these days, uh, for your department, or do you want to go after that cold rape case that no one's been able to you know, solve in the last 10 years? That's a really terrible, terrible policy. I started off by saying if you wanted to design a public policy and make it the worst possible public policy, you'd probably get something looking like civil forfeiture. That's what I mean by that. It has distorted law enforcement priorities, resulted in this policing for profit. And I think the worst thing about it in the end, and I, you know, my uncle uh, was a police officer in California for 30 years, uh, and I respect him greatly, but I think at the end of the day, the worst thing this does is it erodes public faith in the system. When you see people engaging in this kind of conduct, when you find out that there's a DEA agent in Massachusetts who does nothing but surf the internet looking for property to steal. I don't want to use that word advisedly too. Looking, doing nothing but looking for property to steal. How much faith do you really have in that system? How much obedience do you feel uh, to a government that does that to its people? Um, so I think, I think it's not too late to reform this. There's interest in reforming it. There's a, a tremendous amount of new information coming, about, coming out about civil forfeiture. And the good news is no one who has been fully advised about how civil forfeiture works, at least in my experience, goes to bat for it. Uh, so the time is right for reform. There's a bill on the floor of the Minnesota legislature right now uh, to reform Minnesota's laws. Um, What's, what would you say is the main uh, improvement that we're looking for the least? So in Minnesota, uh, <clears throat> when you're stopped for drug uh, drug arrest, what happens is that your person goes into criminal court, but you're, as Clark describes, your assets go into civil court. Title transfers at seizure. And in Minnesota, you have to file Neely versus 2007 Chevrolet Tahoe, or Neely versus $1,296 in U.S. currency in, uh, in a conciliation court or district district uh, uh, district court, and for drug cases, the burden is on the plaintiff, the former property owner, to disprove that that car and that cash were an instrument or the proceeds of the alleged drug crime. And in Minnesota, you can be acquitted for the drug crime but still lose your car and cash in civil court because the burden is on you to disprove that. And that can be difficult or uneconomic for you to even file the, the case. So what, the law, uh, what Senate File 874 does is switch the burden to the government to prove, not uh, away from the property owner, to shift it to the government to prove that you were first convicted of a crime in criminal court and you, your cash and your car were the proceeds and the instrument of that crime. So progress is being made, um, but guess what? The good news is there's room for help if any of you are interested. Um, I think this is going to be a real growth area. Um, I think that's fortunate. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about litigation here. The, 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 um, the appeal of this procedure you know, to the government, to, to law enforcement, is so strong that it's not going to get stamped out next year, five years, or ten years from now. So I believe if you're interested, there's uh, plenty more in the post office, so to speak. Um, so I'll stop there and, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you about civil forfeiture and ask me any questions. growing 
is the average size of the seizure. The average size of the seizure in Minnesota is $1,250. And so that has been pretty, uh, pretty uh, stable. And so this image that, that Minnesota law enforcement is out there busting Colombian and Mexican drug cartels in Bemidji or War Road or International Falls or St. Paul isn't necessarily true. In fact, 95, if you can deal with numbers, and I know this is a law school, so <laughs> I attended this law school, 95% of all seizures are less than $5,000. So the average is 1,200, almost all of them are less than 500. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, so Minnesota is better than most places. Uh, we actually we actually filed a lawsuit um, against a number of police departments in Georgia, because Georgia has a uh, law that requires them to report, and all of, them, all of them were ignoring it, just failing to file the reports. And when we challenged it, their attitude was, literally their attitude in court was, no, that's, that's we just get to decide whether we want to follow that law or not. It was shocking. So, and there are no consequences, none. There are no, even if you're living in a, in, a, in a state where you're theoretically required to report, um, I don't know how many of you are in the securities law, but you probably know about Sarbanes-Oxley and all these incredibly stringent reporting requirements we have for companies in this country, and there are definite consequences if they don't report. If it's the shoes on the other foot, it's the government's failure to report something like how many you know, seizures they're engaging in, zero consequences. And uh, our experience is that many, many uh, uh, departments that are covered by those kinds of laws just completely flaunt them. Sometimes you're even unaware. That's actually kind of comical, because you may have heard this thing about ignorance of the law being no excuse. That actually just turns out to be the case if it's, if it's a citizen, not when it's law enforcement. Uh, one other factoid we know is that um, the um, Justice Department's civil forfeiture fund is now over a billion dollars. So they're literally sitting on a billion dollars worth of seized property. They don't break it down between civil and criminal, so no one knows what that breakdown is. And again, I want to emphasize, um, to me, a criminal forfeiture is a much different kettle of fish. Because at least then, um, you know, well, at least in theory, you've gone through this criminal conviction process. Um, we'll put aside overcharging and plea bargaining, which concerns me greatly, but that's not the topic today. But at least you've had the opportunity for a procedure with, with, with some due process in it. But civil forfeiture, they just don't break it down, so there's no way to know for sure how much of which is, is happening. One of the other differences between criminal forfeiture, if you're to have forfeiture, it would be better to have criminal forfeiture than civil forfeiture, but one of the differences is that in a criminal case, you get a public defender, and that public defender can represent you on the criminal side against the criminal charges as well as the forfeiture-related issues in, in criminal court. But in, when there's civil forfeiture, and your car gets seized, the title gets trimmed, transferred, there's no public defender to be had. And then you start, as a property owner, facing a civil suit, you start doing the calculus. Is my 1996 Nova, Chevrolet Nova, worth that much to hire a uh, attorney? Is my $892 in U.S. currency seized, is it for $1,250, is the average? Uh, is that sufficient enough? Should I spend good money against the, uh, to hire a lawyer to go after this, this uh, uh, cash in, in civil court. Anybody else? Good question. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about immigration law, but I've read that undocumented, especially migrant workers, yeah. are targeted for this because yeah. they carry cash, but they need cash. Are they totally screwed in this happening? Oh, yeah. More so <laughs> than we would be, yeah. Well, uh, it's exactly right. So there's um, a lot of parts of the world, it turns out, where um, banking system is not trustworthy. You don't put substantial amounts of money in your bank if you ever want to see it again. And so it's actually quite common uh, for immigrants in particular to, you, you know, be driving. In fact, I was just reading about an incident where a guy was, um, uh, he was in the grocery business up in New York and he was driving down to buy the stock of a convenience store in Georgia that I guess had gone out of business or something like that. So he had. I forget what it was, it was a lot of them, it was like 100,000 or more on him. Um, and um, the police searched the car, found it, and took it. And he got it back, but it took, I think it was like two years uh, for uh, of litigation, but it happened to be enough money that it was worth you know, hiring a lawyer. So yeah, the answer is, it happens all the time. I'll tell you a quick story about an absolutely appalling case um, in Houston, and uh, it has a happy ending, but only because, and I don't know how this happened, but the uh, family in question 
um, hooked up with uh, a litigation boutique that's you know like half former Supreme Court clerks, and so they were very well represented. But the facts of the case are these: um, it was an Ethiopian family. They were going back to Ethiopia to visit. Um, and they had about thirty thousand um, dollars in cash and money orders on them because you know if you're going, they're going for like two months, and so it's not an unreasonable amount of cash to bring back. As they were um, going through the um, the line to you know for customs and to exit uh, immigration, um, they were asked, which I guess is a routine question, um, how much cash do you have on you? And basically, there's a language issue, as best I can tell, and also the guy didn't necessarily understand that cash includes money orders. And so anyway, the guy said basically. Um, about $20,000. The agent pulled him out of line, presented him with a form, and had him sign a form that said, I have exactly $20,000 on me. Even though he knew the guy had said, I don't know about. Uh, so then they pulled the whole family out of line, basically turned out their pockets and their luggage, and it turned out they had you know, $30,000 when you included the money orders. Took all that money from them all the spot. And the good news, as I said, was they got this excellent law firm uh, that challenged it in federal court and the, the decision from the, or the order from the judge ordering the money to be given back is about a page and a half long. It is absolutely worth reading because this judge was pissed off. And he called the guy. He said, it is, this one sentence that stands out on my mind is he said something like, it is very doubtful whether the security of this country is actually going to be preserved by rascals, you know, basically exploiting people like this. So um, your intuition is exactly right. And people in this position are particularly vulnerable. And of course, on top of everything else, you know, there's the additional leverage of the fact that they are you know, um, uh, vulnerable to being uh, reported. So uh, I, I think that every additional, I mean, put it this way, there's already plenty of leverage on the government side to add this leverage. Um, and and for, for various reasons that I alluded to earlier, cultural and otherwise, that they're just much more likely to be carrying a lot of cash on them. Um, and, you know, the truth of the matter is, at least for some of them, they may not have, you know, a W-2 form. They probably need them. Some of that cash may have just been paid to them in cash on a job site. So it would be very difficult for them to document it. And I think um, probably more often than not, most of them are just going to walk away from it. And, and so when I used the word theft earlier, I wasn't kidding. Other questions? Okay, well, if you're interested in public interest work, um, we'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. And uh, it's notwithstanding, uh, I know I may have laid it on a little bit thick, and I don't want to leave on a down note. Um, the good news is there are groups like the Institute for Justice, ACLU is done doing some of this work. There are groups that are pushing back, um, but every every person, everybody helps. I mean, if you can do a pro bono case one day, you just want to you know, you look into it and write about it. Um, changing the public mentality, informing people that this is happening, um, pointing out injustices like we just talked about, uh, all of that can help. Even if it's just a letter to the editor criticizing something you read in the newspaper, every little bit helps. So. Um, I hope you'll you'll get involved and find the, the uh, issue interesting, and we'd be happy to help over can. So thanks again. Let's make a couple of brief um, announcements. Uh, we have a, we, there's a happy hour tomorrow night at hearings that the uh, Federal Society of Lawyers chapter is hosting. Um, if anybody's interested in that, uh, Lee and the rest of the staff at IJ as well as. Um, Clark are going to be there. That's Kieran's downtown Minneapolis at 5.30. And if you're a Federalist Society member, um, there will be food and drinks as well. Um, it's not too late to sign up with the, with the pet sock as well. Really and I have a whole different rant. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's all new. <laughs> but just as good. Um, the Federal Society here, the uh, food chapter, is going to have an informational meeting on Friday, April 19th. I believe that. We say that. I believe it's at 2 o'clock. So Friday, April 19th at 2 o'clock. Um, we're just going to have an informational meeting about next year. We're going to talk about board elections. If you're interested in finding more, out more about what we do at the student chapter here, um, you're more than welcome to attend. We don't have a room yet, but we are going to have food, and it's going to be pretty informal, so we invite you to that. And then the announcement I'm um, very excited to, to make is that we are um, partnering with the American Constitution Society. It's their um, kind of inaugural event. They just kind of got re, um, rebooted on campus. Uh, we're going to have an event. On April 21st, that's a Monday at 4 p.m., um, we're going to have from the Cato Institute, Ilya Shapiro, and then from the Hammond Law School, um, Professor David Schultz, and they're going to be talking about the Obama administration's record at the Supreme Court over the past five, six years, and, uh, and kind of where, where the administration stands in the eyes of the Supreme Court, some of the wins, some of the losses that they've had, and they're going to debate those, those issues. So that's going to be our last event of the year, and April 21st, that's a Monday at 4 o'clock. So we hope to see you all. There. Thank you for coming again today.